Welcome to Wise Up On Air. <laughs> ah, it's a pleasure to be here today. Uh, thank you for joining us. Of course, this is a live stream where we try to bring you a educational piece of this game audio lifestyle. I'm joined here today by fellow colleagues at Audio Kinetic, uh, and we're going to cover programming a wise plugin today. We're going to start from scratch. Uh, we're going to take it easy, and we're going to use, uh, you know, folks following along to help guide us through this process. Uh, but first, let's introduce the other folks here today. Uh, starting in the top left quadrant, maybe it's right. Uh, Mads Moretti. Mads, welcome. Thanks. Uh, Glad to be here. Good to see you. Uh, Even though I'm not an expert on wise plugins, but uh, I'd gladly help where I can. Famously a uh, recent <laughs> wise one minute on creating a plugin, uh, yeah. which does a great job of wrapping that up super fast. Uh, next to Mads, we have Samuel Longchamp. Welcome, Samuel. Hello, thank you for having me. Excellent, great to have you here. And uh, below we have Michelle Donis. Hey, Michelle. Hey, how are you? Doing great, <laughs> doing great. Awesome. So uh, folks who are just lining up in the chat room, uh, it's great to have your participation here. Uh, as we're going through this, be sure to drop different um, you know, insights that you have, uh, questions that might come up, uh, terminology. If we're spewing words that don't mean anything, uh, you know, give us a hand. We want to make this something that everyone understands. Uh, and just gently lead people through this process. So thanks for joining us today. Uh, I thought it might be interesting to hear a little bit from our guests about what, um, what kind of early formative experiences with audio programming uh, you, know, you might have had that led you on this path. Which one? Yeah, who wants to start? Uh, Michelle, <laughs> I think you volunteered. Oh, yes. So uh, programming in general, I started at three. I was, uh, uh, yeah, I was a tiny toddler and I was executing things. And I started in basic. Uh, basic back then was in English. Uh, and my dad actually created a version of basic in French so I can actually learn. Uh, funny thing, I learned to write on a keyboard first, um, like, like many people are doing right now today. But I started uh, with a keyboard and uh, the, the, the titles and names and stuff, I all learned them uh, with the, the, the proper programming acronyms. So for me, I, I was on a, a Apple II and I learned B run before the brown color in, brun in, in French. So <laughs> yeah, it's a binary run, by, basically. So I, these are my first uh, software. And uh, the first software I did was probably uh, something to play audio on Apple II in assembly language. Uh, so that's the first game audio development I ever had was actually creating a game with a two track playback on an Apple II. So it's been a while. <laughs> Super cool. What a, uh, what a early beginning and a long and storied uh, career you've had since then. Yeah, really strange. <laughs> it's really fun. But uh, I'm, I'm glad to actually have the two passions here at Audio Kinetic to, to be able to play music, to have fun with music, with ukuleles, whatever. I don't do that in real life. Uh, and uh, also programming. So it's, it's a dream come true for me. Yeah. Excellent. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, Samuel, how about you early on? Yeah, it's kind of, yeah, it's kind of crazy. I, I didn't have a computer until like I was 11, 12, something like that. So really the, uh, the programming I first started when uh, before that I was playing video games. So when I started programming, 
what do you think I wanted to program? <laughs> Video games. And so I started back in the days with the RPG Maker. And I basically did games, uh, even for school, on, on, on different themes. I remember uh, staying at the recess to program my game. And uh, at this time, back then, the audio program that I could do was really just play sound, right? So you had a bunch of sound trying to arrange them. And so it was like light years away from what Wise can do today. And so I'm so glad to have seen how far we can go from a basic game to something so complex as to have interactive music and a game design with spatial audio. And uh, yeah, so that's the journey, basically starting from uh, very basic games to yeah, basically just doing tools now for people doing complex, complex designs. Exactly, exactly. And it's those kind of fundamentals, like uh, sometimes that's all a game needs. Play a sound, right? Done. And whether you're you're just starting out uh, making your first sounds, like when uh, when you started, or yeah, you have the uh, the gigantic effort that it takes to get a modern game out the door. Um, yeah, Wise is is there for you, and it's great to have you behind the scenes uh, working on that. Um, it's great to have you here today. Thanks thanks for your help. Yeah, I'm so glad trying to make those plugins accessible that's been uh, our focus for about uh, well many months now so Absolutely. hopefully you'll learn something today <laughs> cool mads got anything early programming stories in your life <laughs> well um i think i started pretty late compared to these other guys uh, I, I i started only in the university programming actually so i haven't really done any programming before that like other than a bit of website programming and such but I kind of, uh, I didn't really feel enthusiastic about programming at all. But then there was a, like a teacher and a professor that told me that um, that the best way of learning programming is actually that like showing something what they can do with it, and then afterwards tell them that this was programming. And I had the same kind of method that I was like when going to the university, I was learning how to make games, and I thought this was pretty cool actually. But but then I realized that this is just like basically programming and like with programming you can get these kind of functionalities and so i'm very driven by the end goal of what i can use it for rather than like programming and so. and that's a that's a great place to transition because talking about plugins today uh you know wise comes with a whole suite of plugins right flangers and distortions and you know reverbs and whatnot uh there's a whole other world of plugins that I think we're used to coming from linear media, like the VST marketplace is an ever expanding open door of other kinds mm -hmm. of plugins. And I think that this uh, ability to create your own plugin that we're going to walk through today, again, starts to open that door to people's, um, desires to bring these other kinds of tools to runtime, to the runtime environment uh, using WISE so that they can extend the kind of sounds and interactions that they can harness to support their game. Uh, and so I just wanted to talk about a couple other um, plugins for WISE that I know of. And if, if you all have a few, throw them in. But when I think about some big triple A games, um, Quantum Break from Remedy uh, built their own um, granular synthesizer with which the, they like, as they time stretch the entire game will actually take and manipulate the entire soundtrack in conjunction with that visual um, time scrubbing, right? So this is a way that they then built a WISE plugin to extend and support the functionality of that gameplay. Uh, and they've done a, a WISE tour with us. You can head to our YouTube channel and have a, a overview of some of the techniques they used in Quantum Break, uh, as well as some uh, for Control. Uh, did anyone see the Control live stream earlier this morning where the audio team was on there? Uh, I did, wasn't able to tune in, but uh, again, a, a team and a company that's doing a lot of great things uh, with sound. Uh, I'll also mention Near Automata. Uh, they have a, 
article that we'll link you to that uh, details several plugins that they created for that game. Uh, some cool bit crushers, different filters for different reasons. Again, all in support of the gameplay. Uh, and that's just tip of the iceberg, right? Um, as well as the additional plugins that you can install uh, when you install WISE. Um, we have uh, our, our partner plugins. We also have our community plugins um, where people in the community have created plugins for people to access through the plugin uh, architecture and the launcher. Uh, that's the WISE launcher. Uh, and then just folks out in the community uh, who are, are maybe not positioning those through the WISE launcher, but are just making them for their own, um, for their own needs and desires and, and learning experiences. Uh, we featured um, one of these community members on a previous WISE Up on Air back in August, and that was um, Sam Mackey who created a suite of plugins like a wave table, a bit crusher, a transient mm -hmm. shaper. Uh, again, just um, doing great things out in the community. Happy to have this network of people who are creating and extending the functionality of WISE. Uh, any other pro plugins that y'all have been dreaming in on for, uh, for extending WISE? Anything you wish there was? So many, so many. We we all have dreams. Of course, we we are all users of Wise. Uh, I I first started actually fixing games. Uh, my 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 career is pretty much on game audio and uh, in game in general, gaming and developing for games and whatever. And I was uh, the go to guy for many things uh, audio related. So when I started working in WISE, uh, I could actually uh, see the other side of the fence. Mm. And obviously, I have dozens and dozens of these ideas, uh, from uh, helpers to things for, uh, for, for, for the betterment of uh, many people, especially for the, uh, what's called accessibility uh, users and things like that. So there's so many things that could actually be achieved, but so may, so little time, that's the big problem. Of course, of course. Uh, speaking of time, let's get down to it. Are we ready to uh, <laughs> bring this soft introduction to creating plugins in WISE? Yeah, I think we are. Fantastic. <clears throat> if you guys are. <laughs> of course. Let's go. Uh, so I'm transitioning right. to the presentation from Samuel, if you'd like to take it over mm -hmm. and get us started. Thanks. And right. everybody, remember that none of this is uh, required uh, to be a programmer. So ask any questions in the chat or anything that we'll try to explain whatever is going on. It's very important for us that it, like any wise user could potentially do this and not just a programmer itself. So uh, feel free to post it. Yeah, exactly. I think it's important to just understand that <clears throat> we're trying to put uh, all the tools in your hands so you can uh, get started as quick as you can. There are a couple of requirements just set up that I'm just not going to cover here, uh, but we're going to mention it. And if uh, you, you need references, we can provide them uh, what, what to install exactly. Anyways, we'll go through these steps uh, just like you did, Matt. So we'll do a, <laughs> a one-hour session on what is essentially <laughs> summarized in one minute. It's going to be fun. Yeah. Um, and if, so and I, if, if anyone is looking for the references of like, hey, where to download Visual Studio and all those kind of things, head into the One Minute Wise video. And all the links are in the description uh, also for what we're going to go through. So, uh, so yeah, if you want to replicate the setup. Yeah, I'd invite you to follow along also if you are already set up or close to. Uh, but for now, I'm just going to take a step back. And uh, before we dive into code and uh, installation of stuff, I uh, just wanted to go into details of the concepts, just so we know what we're talking about. Right? So what's a plugin exactly, two wise, and uh, what it represents in the audio pipeline. So I'll start with just a basic schema. Um, Here's uh, basically just the architecture in terms of the nodes, the audio nodes. So when you're were, um, doing audio in WISE, uh, the plugins that it uses um, basically come in three flavors. 
There is one that is a source that you can see here. We have the class that's related to that in C++. Uh, and what it does is relatively simple. It takes no input and output sound. So it's just a producer's, right? It's, that's why it's, a, it's called source. If, if you uh, were to do this in a VST, it will be the equivalent of a VST instrument. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, and it, be, it can be fed uh, MIDI, for example, uh, and all that kind of uh, interesting stuff. Um, as far as uh, the rest of the pipeline, and a vast majority of, of plugins are uh, of that second type, it's the effect. The effect takes some uh, audio information, some audio stream data, and outputs some other audio stream data. Um, it comes in two flavors, which I'll discuss uh, shortly. Uh, but let me just go over the third one, which is the sync. The sync is rarely implemented uh, by generally anybody, but it does exist because what it takes, it takes all the stream audio data. It uh, uh, basically just transmits it to some device or uh, some medium to play it back on the real world. Uh, so it only takes uh, audio stream, doesn't output anything. And so generally speaking in wise, that's what you're going to get, and that's uh, basically, what you you have to choose first, which one to implement. Um, as far as the effect are concerned, there are two ways to do uh, an effect, and perhaps you've seen that in other other um, introduction to plugins and 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 effects, audio effects. Uh, there's one way that's the in place effect. Uh, basically, what it takes is just the audio stream and data as it is, and doesn't change. Um, doesn't change the, the the stream to a different data stream. It's the same data stream that's being worked on. So instead of a copy, for example, from one to the other, uh, it, you just work directly on it. So it consumes and produces at the same rate, essentially. Uh, that's good for a lot of, uh, of effects, but some effects you need to consume the data and produce it at different rates. An example of that is a resampler rate. So <laughs> that's uh, self-explanatory. So what it takes, the out of play effect is essentially two variables that represent all your streams, the input and the output. Whereas the first one was an in place, it's an in and out. So it's both. Uh, you have the two C++ classes that represent them. And basically what it does is that they have a function that execute the DSP code. Uh, and it's just a signature that's different. The rest is uh, all the same. So they have a common set of stuff in effect. Okay, hold on a second. Hold on. Classes, <laughs> functions, <laughs> like C++, like, whoa, whoa. Okay. That's a lot of words, right? <laughs> I've heard them before, for sure. But, but what we're talking about is we're talking about a programming language and yes. parts of the pro programming language that you establish, uh, I don't know. Give me a give me a rough definition of what a class and a function is like. Sure. Uh, to put it simply, a function what it does it has it it does some behavior. It changes. It munches data around. Right. So it uh, it affects mathematical operations. Uh, typically, you could think uh, one. Simple way to, uh, to to think of a plugin is essentially just applying mathematical functions to the audio stream. The audio stream is, a, in our case, digital, right? Yep. So it's uh, samples, and you just go through each sample, apply some magical thing that your DSP does, and output that. Uh, mm -hmm. If it's a source, you create that data. If it's a sync, you take it and you do something. But it's essentially only this. Yep. The function is that list of operations. That's what it does. Bam. The class, I'm just going to cover a class because essentially our API is C++. So C++ has that whoop, addition over C, that, that, and that's why it's called C++, uh, that it has classes. And the classes, is, it's really just a group of functions, so behavior, mongling, mathematical stuff, and data. And data is assigned to the same unit. And then you can use the data with those functions, and it become like in a package. And so the package we're going to create is a plugin that has uh, some data that you can use, parameters, for example. could be a, a volume slider that they're represented as, as data in that class. And the behavior is the DSP code, right? Brilliant. That was a perfect summation. It brings me right up to speed 
uh, with what you were just talking about, and I think it uh, effortlessly transitions us to the next piece. Yeah. Before we do that, maybe I should just uh, mention that we had a question in the chat oh, go saying ahead. Um, why plugins can be created in PD as well, right? Like pure data, which is a, a that is true actually. But if you do that, and there's a one minute wise video for that as well. If you do that, there's, you should know there's some limitations to what uh, things you can put in your pure data patch in order to when you need to convert it into a wise plugin. But all of that is covered much more in a um, one minute wise plugin uh, video that we'll post in the description. We have a plans for a future wise up on air that uh, will go a little bit more into uh, pure data and heavy. Hmm. And so tune in, get subscribed for that and, uh, and dig for Manza's one minute wise on, uh, on that process. Cool. Yeah, it's an interesting tool. Uh, and, and basically it's just, it's an automation of what we're going to do manually today. So create some source files and compile them. And so we're just going to look at, inside the box, see what's going on. Perfect. Uh, but again, before going that, we've seen basically just the types of effects, sources, and sinks that can can be created in Wise. But uh, we still have to have a mental image of what what Wise is essentially, and where are where are we going to put our plugin? Um, so let's start with a blank page. I'm just going to go through each elements of what what Wise is and where the plugin falls in. So let's start first element. We got the sound engine, right? Well, the sound engine. And WISE is an acronym for a sound engine, anyways. Um, so the WISE sound engine <laughs> uh, runs in the game. It's essentially running on a console. It's running on your computer, on your mobile phone, uh, everywhere. But that's essentially just the thing that's instantiated in the game and that processes all the audio from the data that some other piece of software created. So our plugin will need to go into that to run DSP code, essentially. So WISE is going to orchestrate when and how to call your plugin. And um, basically, it needs a list of those plugins. So your plugin, when you're creating your project and stuff, uh, you're assigning it to different objects and all these things. Sound Engine is just going to create as many instances of your plugin as it needs and call execute when needed. So it owns a couple of your plugin or some other plugin. The plugin itself that we're going to create uh, needs also some state. So we've already discussed the class. And thanks, Damien, for <laughs> reminding me that I need to go into that this with this. Um, <laughs> the data that I talked earlier is also represented uh, in our API as a class. Um, it's uh, basically the aggregation of parameters. And that's going to be a class for us. Uh, that class, when you create an object on it, so it's a concrete object, a, a region in memory with all that data. Um, this piece is going to be owned by our plugin also. So when we're going to create our plugin, we're going to get past a parameter of our type and with the parameters that we are going to define. Uh, so that's just, um, just a, a basic overview of what's going on when you have wise running in the sound engine. Um, your plugin running in the wise sound engine, that is. So to get there, <laughs> we still need to have somebody design that thing. So you can't just have plugins instantiated by themselves. Um, there's that thing we have that's called the authoring, the wise authoring application, which is probably what most of you guys use. Um, this project editor, that's what it is, uh, takes some project data in the form of XML and blah, 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 we call the work units and generate uh, another type of data of files, essentially, that we call sound banks. And this sound bank is just a big blob of data that represents the project into a more whoop, squished up version with all the sounds, with all the objects, all the description of what the parameters we want uh, are going to be, what has been set in, pro in the project. Sometimes um, I feel like a big blob of data. <laughs> we are <Well>. all. <laughs> And so the sound banks, when uh, you package your game, you're packaging the sound banks with the sound engine. And so the sound engine is essentially going to, uh, when you, you do a, a load of a sound bank, you're bringing that and reading that memory. 
and you're trying to read what's in it to create the plugins. And so there's a, a bunch of blocks in there that are called parameter blocks we're going to see later on. And Grosso Modo is just reading that block into the parameters uh, at runtime. And that's what you're going to get in your plugin. And that's how it gets there. It's read directly from the sound bank. And there's a function to, a function to do that. Uh, once you got that, there, that's fun because Sound Engine is gonna it's gonna run. You're gonna have parameters doing stuff on your plugin, but uh, those parameters may change. There's stuff with the RTPCs and everything that that's what's so great about Wise. It changes at runtime, and so there are a couple of ways to have that changed. Um, when you're authoring your game, you can profile it directly, so you can connect to your game, connect to the Sound Engine, and change values so you can play around and see see how it sounds. That profiling setup is a communication channel over a network uh, and can send changes to parameters. And so that's the last thing uh, that's the, just going to cover quickly is how parameters are basically changed at runtime later on. There's the RDPC system from WISE, and there's the profiling system from uh, the, the WISE author. Um, the other way around, through that same communication channels, uh, the plugin can send data back to show in the authoring what's going on. Um, and so there's that monitor route right here that uh, we can send back data. We're going to glance quickly over it today. It's just so you know it's there. So um, we have mostly a complete picture of what uh, the, all the data and all the plugin uh, lie. And we're just going to go and dive here. How do we create this piece here? And I think. It's important to say that we're kind of using the word game parameter and RTPC, which is real-time parameter control, uh, interchangeably in a lot of ways, right? Uh, game parameter being maybe the, the game side um, parameterization of some value, uh, how the velocity of something or uh, whether it's day or night, uh, and a real-time parameter controller or RTPC in WISE, which is uh, when we receive that per parameter from a game, the ability to author using that parameter using uh, curves and other, and other methods in the authoring application. Sound right? Yeah, that's a good uh, that's a good overview. And basically, those parameters that are right here, we're going to call them RTPC able. <laughs> so bam, that's a yeah, it's a self made word. Excellent. Um, I think uh, we can go uh, go on and and just do the setup uh, if you guys are ready. Uh, so I invite you guys online to uh, just follow along and install uh, at least the basics. So the basics would be, to me at least, uh, wise. <laughs> so we're going to go on uh, audioconnected.com and fetch the launcher. The launcher we're just appreciate here. in the meantime that uh, Samuel actually made a presentation using code. <laughs> 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 it's funny when you realize that an SVG is just a big XML file, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <It's cool>. <laughs> Hardcore. <clears throat> All right, so we're just going to install it. And so uh, what you're going to need, and that's um, there's a, a part of that described in the documentation, and perhaps that's something I need to, uh, to mention. Um, there's a documentation section on the WISE SDK documentation that uh, talks about creating audio plugins. So you can find that, and I suggest you open that already. Uh, on your side, WISE SDK, um, you can search that on Google easily. Going further, creating new plugins and audio plugins. So audio plugin is the one we're, uh, we're on. You can maybe post that, that link directly in the description or uh, in the chat. So once we have the launcher, uh, all we need is WISE, essentially. And when installing WISE, you just uh, need to check the couple of dependencies that we're going to need. So first thing is authoring. So that's the part where we're going to be able to test the UI. And the SDK. So the SDK is the uh, code that includes the headers, all that C++ mumbo jumbo that's going to uh, help us create our plugin. 
Software um, development kit? Software development kit, yes. Um, I'm on Windows right now uh, through a VM. So I'm just going to select Windows, all the thing. There are multiple tool sets. That's for your Visual Studio uh, version. Right now, I have 2019 installed. I'm just going to grab everything uh, to make sure everything's fine. And uh, I have a little uh, specification. If you're targeting anything that builds with Make, uh, for example, Android, you'll probably want to install Wise in the directory that has no space, just because the handling of space is kind of tricky. Uh, so what I'm going to do is simply install it directly on my C. Don't worry about it. And go to the next page. In the next page, we have all the plugins. So I definitely want that one because it's awesome. Uh, <laughs> and all the other ones, I'm just going to install all that's there. Agree. And we're going to download and install it. So there's not, uh, not too many files we selected. We're just uh, stay directly with um, the C++ SDK for Windows. Of course, if you're on Mac uh, and you're targeting to have a sound engine version of your Mac plugin, uh, you'll want to install the, the Apple section uh, where you can target iOS, tvOS, and Mac. Uh, and I'll take this uh, moment just to explain how plugins, because we've seen plugins uh, in the generic way, but how do they work uh, on Mac? Uh, since some of you are probably on uh, an Apple system, um, because uh, the wise authoring application, the UI part, is running through uh, what's called the, uh, the crossover uh, application, which is essentially Wine. Um, the libraries that are being used are not macOS built libraries. They're still the Windows built libraries. So if you were expecting to be able to build a UI plugin, so the authoring part on your Mac, uh, you still need some Windows environment to be able to build that part and then you could test it on your window, uh, on your Mac system, that is. Uh, but essentially, it's the same application that uh, is being run on, on Wise. They're, they're the same files. Um, however, if you want to test the sound engine part and have a Mac built game, then you can build them uh, on your Apple system. Hmm. Were you about to say something, Matt? Uh, no, I was just like uh, asking for uh, the uh, Mac specifications like uh, so eventually that means that you are safer building plugins on windows right at the current state um yeah. but eventually like it's, it's still possible to use whatever thing you have on uh, like if you make something on windows use it on mac as well uh, you could also if you have a mac um i do that a couple of times also since i also am a mac user i use bootcamp for example to create some different things and since you on Mac, you can reserve a certain amount of your hard drive temporarily. You can do that if you want to try out some different plugins. And then you can just give back the, the hard drive space afterwards back to, to your Mac version. So, so that's just a good solution for now, at least. Uh, yeah. One of the questions on the chat is, do you need to have a Mac to build a plugin for Mac? And the authoring part is only for Windows right now. So that part and all the GUI is all for Windows. And the crossover wine thing is just an emulator. So it emulates Windows on your Mac. But the sound engine part, you actually need to have the proper uh, uh, platform development kit for the platform you are aiming for. So uh, some platforms use Windows. Most platforms use Windows, especially for uh, uh, for uh, gaming platforms. Uh, Android, you can work on Mac or PC. Uh, and uh, iOS, macOS, tvOS, uh, you actually need to have a Mac in order to build your plugin there. So you need to have access to the platform development kit in order to build a sound engine. We cannot provide that. Uh, we, we could not just start sending all the development kits. Yeah, sure, you, you want to work on this, whatever, next gen. Yeah, sure, here, it will work. Uh, that's not how things work in, in real life. So I'm sorry, yes, you need a Mac for the Mac version of your plugin. But I think that was a great, uh, that was a great thing to underline for people when, when we talk about building plugins for different platforms that require the hardware, um, 
whether we're talking about Mac, PlayStation, Xbox, or something else, right, that does become a requirement at some point to have access to to that software in order to in order to build for it. Hmm. So exactly. Great question. Thanks for that. And so while this is uh, finalizing in the installation, uh, I can just go over the development tool. So we're trying to make uh, building plugins easy. So um, people at AK develop um, this uh, tool that's called WP.py. So it's a Python tool. That's why it's PY. And WP means wise plugin. Um, and so that gives you WP.py. And essentially, what it does is wrap around all the uh, it wraps all the operations that are typical for plugin creation. That includes uh, creating uh, just a, a, from a template, providing a template uh, for the right type of plugin you want to create, uh, creating solutions for the various uh, platforms that you're targeting, building it, and then packaging it for the launcher. So that's a bunch of of things that we're going to go through. Uh, we can see all of them there. Okay. And terminology break. Solution. Yeah. <laughs> I know that. Solution. I know that solution is a, a thing. What's a solution? So a solution, and I'm actually going to go there and, and show uh, one solution that we got. Great. So if you've been uh, in the SDK part of that wise install. That's why we, when we check the SDK, that's what it added. In our WISE installation directory, we have SDK now. The SDK offers a couple of stuff. So you have those targets that are the binaries for the sound engine. Uh, that's what uh, are going to run on the platform, in, this, in our case, Windows. And there's that uh, include directory, what all the headers are, and some source that are uh, helper sources. What I'm going to show right now is the samples. So samples is a very nice place for you to start on because ah, we provide a couple of uh, things for you to get started. We have plugins. So that's a good place to get started today on uh, the topic. And we have sample plugins, one of each type, basically. We have a, a delay as an effect, audio source is a, is a source. <laughs> Sign is a source as well. And uh, we have a sync. Uh, tone generator, that's a, um, a source. So a solution, what is it? A uh, solution is a workspace. That's how I would uh, explain it. It's it. uh, what the, your IDE, your, your software uh, to edit the code uses to uh, places all the sources and where to build uh, the, the binaries once they are compiled and linked. Um, and it also allows you to debug. So there's, it usually comes with a debugger. So everything is all in place. You can put your breakpoints. And so that file right there, the solution just encompasses a set of projects. In this case, sample plugins PC, we've got all the projects for the sample plugins right here. And the but folders we've got. Can, can you explain a, in a second day why there is three files and not just one solution oh, yeah. that we need to? Yes. So uh, back when I installed uh, Wise, I checked Windows, uh, and I can show it again. And Windows right here has multiple targets. We'll, we'll call them tool sets, essentially. And those tool sets are different versions of Visual Studio. We have uh, 2015, 2017, 2019. If you go on uh, Microsoft's website, that's that's how it's gonna. they're going to be called. Um, behind the doors, uh, we have... Uh, the number of the tool set that uh, their versions. So it's not, uh, it, they're one-to-one, -one, but they don't uh, don't follow the exact same nomenclature, but you have Visual Studio 2015 is VC 140, 2017 is 150, and 2019 is 160. Sometimes those are also called 140, 141, 142, because they are on the same major version. You might come into this, uh, but for our uh, whole SDK, we refer to them as 140, 150, 160. Um, so excellent question. And uh, I did mention I have 2019 Visual Studio 2019 installed, so I'm going to use the 160 if I want to open the project right there. Uh, the version selector usually just grabs the one that fits uh, by default. Um, so we can see right there. And I'll take that time to present actually what's what we got in the samples. We have a perfect answer also in the comments uh, that says, says that uh, a solution 
is a file that creates a merge problems in version control. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. And that's very funny because that, that's actually a, a reason why we have <clears throat> one of the steps in the, the, the wp.py uh, tool that I'm going to go over. Uh, that, that's a partial solution to that problem. Uh, but as far as you're concerned, when you're going to generate your plugin, you're going to have that solution. You can open it in Visual Studio. Those projects are going, to, in your case, you're going to have some projects that are static, shared. We're going to go over that thing. Uh, but essentially, you can just build that and see what the code that is encompassing to that project uh, looks like. Um, for today, I'm going to use VS Code. If some of you uh, have used VS Code before, uh, that might uh, that might come helpful as well. There's a couple of more steps to configure it, uh, so I'm just going to go over that as well. Uh, but for Visual Studio itself, it's mostly already out of the box configured. Yeah, for what um, it's worth, you you do need one of the Visual Studios uh, 15, 17, 19 installed. But then you can install VS Code on the top of that and just forget all about v v Visual Studio to, uh, to <laughs> 2019 from that point on. So you yeah. can just decide. It's, it depends on what you wish to actually achieve and mm -hmm. how you are, how do you, uh, what kind of uh, IDE do you prefer? Exactly. So I'm just very familiar with VS Code. I use it every day. And there's the additional bonus of uh, when you regenerate those solution, and that's that's the interesting part. Uh, you're not going to have to reload every time, so that's that's a nice perk. Um, basically, right now we have uh, I've gone over the samples, but uh, there is another interesting folder that we got installed with Wise. It's the scripts uh, folder, so that's where we're going to start our journey uh, by going to get that tool for us that w dot uh, w p.py tool. Um, it's right there, scripts, pl build, plugins, and you've got the WP. So it's some of you maybe have used Git or not at all, but it's uh, essentially a command with subcommands. So all of the other subcommands are separate script. You can use them directly or use WP and then the name of the command. Um, so one thing WP I'm going to show is you. is kind of like the parent script that kicks yes. off all the subscripts as part of it. Exactly. Got it. Uh, and that's a, a very interesting element also to know is that you don't use it directly from where it is. You use it from where you want your project to be. So the first thing we're going to do is just create, um, essentially, I've already done that. But in my documents, I created a, a folder where I want my plugin to be. And inside that folder, when I'm going to create it, there's going to be a new folder, which will be my plugin. Uh, so that's my VS Code workspace. Um, if you want to open a command directly, uh, terminal essentially, directly into that folder, there's a neat trick. You can just click in the, the address bar right here and type command. Command is the name of the, the common prompt in Windows. And that's going to open you a common prompt with the right uh, working directory. That's how we call it, the directory where you are uh, already in there. Whenever I open That's a command trick. prompt, I feel like I'm in the matrix. It's like, yeah, well, <laughs> you fine. are. You're, yeah, you're kind of close to it. If if we're green, <laughs> green on black, then uh, uh -huh. amber. <laughs> Excellent. All right. So once I'm where I want to work, uh, we can start using wp.py. And how we do it, we just uh, take that w.py file and I drag and drop it there, and it's just gonna Print the whole pad there to that WP. And just, uh, uh, just for reference, what what the since you're dragging in that file now, what Python version do you have? And, oh, uh, uh, that's interesting. Um, Python when you install it, and that's mm -hmm. one thing I didn't mention before. I'm using Python three point eight point six that just was just released. Uh, when you install it, it comes with on Windows a Python uh, launcher. That's how it's called. It's just Py, right? And so from Pi, you can type in to know what version it is. So I'm going to ask him and answer your question. I'm using 3.8.6. Perfect. And uh, that WPY uh, can work with uh, Python.7. Uh, so the last major version of Python, it, it, it works with both versions. But we do suggest you upgrade to 3.8 
uh, or any three basically since uh, 2.7 was deprecated. Um, and actually, uh, like just a side note, I, I have both the Python 2 and 3 installed. And what I've discovered is that when I write py, it takes the third version of Python. But when I write Python, it refers to the Python 2. Well, if you have um, it installed. Yeah, <laughs> in my yeah, case, exactly. But in your yeah. case, you're absolutely right. And yeah. so if you want to always be sure of the version you use, you can use py always and specify whether you want the 3 or the 2. Hmm. And then call your script. And that's going to work. Well, not in my case, because I don't have the, the two. But if I specify three, then that's going to show me, uh, in this case, the help. So the list of commands. Mm -hmm. uh, good, uh, good things about the Python. So getting that set up correctly is, is the first step <laughs> to being yeah. able to at least see this message. So if you can see this message, you're, you're good. You're at the right place. And yeah. there's a ton of places online that can walk you through establishing your Python environment uh, using you know whatever operating system you're on uh yeah great a question yeah, coming and then in on top of that there's just um the installing markdown and ginger too right oh yeah uh, if you want did to you already do that yeah uh, so we're not going to build documentation but uh i'll do mention here that you can use pip through pi to install those two dependencies for building documentation. That's uh, like a further step later on. Uh, today, we're mostly going to focus on the sound engine part, uh, which has no documentation yet. So just going to step over that part. Um, Great. And a clarifying question coming in from the from the chat. Uh, are WISE plugins written in Python, but the core no, WISE sound not. engine is C++? <laughs> So, no, they are not. Everything is written in C++. The sound engine part is in C++. Uh, the Python part is to help people actually creating plugins. Uh, would you believe uh, this tool was not available a few years ago? So this is a quite recent effort to actually help people create plugins much uh, easier than before, because all of the things that we will be discussing today had no documentation, no way to actually figure that out except trial and errors. And then you hoped for the best. And uh, we are using that tool internally also. So we are really happy to have that. It makes our lives much easier also just developing in general. So uh, whatever you are seeing here, uh, it's not something just for you guys. It's for us too. We are dog fooding all of this. Exactly. And so I just want to mention, don't be intimidated by the, the terminal, the command prompt. Uh, even you, Damien, you can do it, I'm sure. I know. Uh, <laughs> and there's one thing that you can do when you're not sure of something and how to use it. It's called for help, right? And so that command, like many other commands, had the dash dash help to tell you what it can do. And uh, that's supported in both uh, the basic wp.py uh, and any actions, so example, in this case, we're going to start with the first thing, the first command we're going to use in WP, which is new. We're going to create a plugin. So I'm just following that part of the guide right here, if you want to follow along. Um, when we do a uh, new, uh, you can pass a bunch of, uh, of parameters for your new plugin. But haha, we don't want to do that. We're just going to go interactive and have it ask us questions. And by the end of the questions, we're just going to have a plugin ready to be built. So let's do that, wp.py new. It asks us which, ty which type of plugins uh, we should build. And basically, we have source, sync, effects, and mixer is kind of a weird effect that we're not going to cover today. Uh, but let's go with a, an effect, since it's uh, uh, pretty generic. Um, unit out of place processing. Oh, we remember that part. What was that again? So do we want to be able to process out of place, having two buffers, or just one? Uh, I think we're going to be good with one. So let's just uh, type enter. No is the default. That's why it's in parentheses. So OK, no. And uh, project name. So today we're going to create a game. So let's call it a, a WOA game. <laughs> WOA for white on air. <laughs> um, we want to perhaps display it. Uh, with a better name in WISE itself. Just going to write my name if I can write correctly. And some description. It is a 
Super gain. Awesome. So with all those information, uh, am I happy with it? Do I want to create that plugin? Is it OK? Parentheses is yes, so I can just press Enter. I'm happy. And boom, if I go in my Visual Studio and even in, uh, in Windows Explorer, uh, we can see that that new folder, and that's where my terminal was at this point uh, exactly, got a new folder under it. And it's got all the files ready to be built and ready to be edited. Um, so just before we start editing code, we're just going to make sure our setup is OK. Uh, the first thing after that is to create the haha solution. So you're, those of you who have seen the, the files right now have seen that there are no SLN, the solution for Visual Studio, no VCX brush, so no project. Um, instead, we got some weird files, uh, premake plugin.lua. Premake, what is that? So I'm going to actually open that file so you can see. Premake allows us to create the solutions. So we don't have to commit them into source control. We don't have to deal a bit, uh, with them. We just generate one type of solution and project for each of the platforms we want to target and then use that and you're good. So no need to track that. And like a, one of our users there uh, be uh, in, a, in a merge hell. <laughs> so by default, all the files that have been added to your project are already listed there, uh, ready to be uh, essentially created and added to the solution. So we, we can just leave it like that. But if you want to add files, um, because you add new new sources, you just need to add them to those lists. So there's a static file, shared file, that's uh, for creating a DLL, and that's for a static library that I'm just going to mention briefly. A static library is a version uh, that's basically when you build your game, they just get smooshed into the executable, whereas a DLL, they are kept separated from uh, the game and are loaded once you run the game. And that other section is the authoring part. So it's mostly the front end. And uh, it has its own folder right there. So you got the sound engine plugins. That's, that includes both the static shared, the two first parts we saw. And the WISE plugin is the authoring part. So we call WISE in the generic term for, for authoring here. Uh, and so also, let me ask a question in this case then. Yes. We haven't pre-made -made it yet. So no. meaning that, like, why? does the thing we did with the new, why doesn't it pre-make it right away instead of us having to do that as a second step? Uh -huh, excellent question. Uh, the first thing you have to pass to pre-make is the platform. So we don't know what platforms you want to target. Uh, perhaps you want to start with the authoring part. Perhaps you want to start with Windows. Perhaps you want to start with Android. Um, so we could have pre-made everything. Uh, based yeah, on your that, can, that, are, that can always be changed, right? Yes, sure. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, but we're, we're leaving this decision to you to define what you want to do. And so we're just going to go, uh, go ahead and call premake through, again, WP, always WP. No need to use any other tools. And that's going to fetch uh, and use the, uh, the executable for premake that's already ship with wise, you have nothing to worry about. All you have to do, we call help, is uh, be in the right directory. That's one part. <laughs> so <laughs> you have to be in your plugin directory, uh, the WA again in my case, to uh, start using WP for that plugin. So CD does change directory, and you can go in that directory, in my case, WA again. And then we're going to see what premake can do. And so premake is really works. one of those uh, subscripts of WPPy that you're yes. you're basically saying, hey WPPy, you're kind of in charge of all these subscripts. Uh, can you do this premake <laughs> one for me? And then you're actually going to start feeding it arguments and and giving it uh, specifications as part of that com command line operation, right? Exactly. exactly. Yeah. And so I've asked WP the, to give me the help for premake. And we can see the platforms it supports right there. So it needs one argument there. That's called platform. Uh, and so I need to pass for here 
um, next to pre-make, what I need to put here is either authoring, so the, that's going to create the, the projects for uh, wise authoring, or one of those windows, since I have installed all three tool sets. So we know I have Visual Studio 2019. I'm just going to select the 160, because that's the one that corresponds to 2019. Can't even copy there. And let's pre-make that and see what, what this does. And again, just kind of closing the loop here. So the first argument you're making it is to WPPy. You're saying, hey, yeah. I want to invoke pre-make. And then you're feeding in a second argument. You're saying, yeah, this is the platform that I want. And this is all just lining up in your command line operation. And again, it just points to these specific things and wraps them all up and does them for you. Exactly. Got it. And uh, what's fun is that it uses the the wise, because the WP is located under some wise installation, if you want to target some other wise version, you can just use the WP from that version, and it's going to target when you build that version of wise. And so there's really nothing to set up. No, no environment variables or blah, blah, blah. Just use the right WP, use the commands, Precise what platforms could be Android, iOS, whatever, and get working with the solutions. Awesome. We are using this internally also. This was one big project to actually make sure that uh, Premake was working everywhere, including for other people. And uh, a few good reasons. First, you can automate that. You can create small scripts that you double click and does everything for you. Uh, you can ask your build machine to actually automate that. Uh, and you can target a whole lot of platforms. So you, if you have, like us, we, we, we have like dozens of platforms that we need to support and they are constantly changing depending on the version that we support. So 2019 doesn't necessarily have the same platforms than 2020 or 2018 or whatever. So it's the same. It's, it's, it's always uh, it's always interesting for us to be able to pre-make things uh, easily and actually target something very precisely with our build machines. So it's easy to do. It's easy to use. It's easy to use for WP.py, but it's also uh, something that can be automated. So it's really cool for that. Awesome. Yeah. Or if you want to use it in a stream deck, for example, as a single button to do something yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so we have those solutions. And I already mentioned we could just open them in Visual Studio right, and start editing. Uh, but even the build, um, the, the, the build operation can be done through WP. And what's nice about that is that it's not go always going to be Visual Studio you're going to use. Sometimes, like I mentioned, for Android, it's going to be make. And so you would have to go and find the right make file and do make and blah, blah, blah. Don't worry about that. Just have WP call build. And essentially, for, again, a platform, it's going to find the right way to build for that platform and do it for you. Just going to print whatever is going on here. So uh, it it's also works for Windows. So in this case, we're just going to build a basic plugin that has been built for us, has been copied for us, um, by specifying the exact name of the platform I just used for pre-make. So I just essentially replaced the pre-make word by build here. And a configuration. Oh, what's a configuration? Configuration here uh, is either debug, profile, or release. So that has to do with if you enable some optimization that um, makes debugging harder, that would be like release. If you disable those, then it's like a debug version. So it, it, it helps with debugging, essentially. You, it enables also asserts and all that kind of stuff. So in our case, we're just going to debug first, just a uh, basic version. And so that, uh, that flag is the C for configuration. And we're just going to specify, I want a debugger. And if you don't remember the dash C, it will tell you, you forgot the configuration. You can go to the help. And it will actually remind you, you can put, put dash C and have the configuration, which can be one of these. Uh, and one interesting part about this is, uh, remember when I said you need to have your uh, your platform development kit. In our case here, the platform development kit is Visual Studio 2019. So this is why we are supporting 
uh, Windows underscore VC160. This is why we wrote that. If you had the proper Android uh, software development kit, platform development kit for Android, then you will put Android here. So you can go in the documentation and actually look at what you actually need in order to build something, a, pl uh, a plugin for Android. And in the documentation, you have all the information to tell you, you actually need to install this and this and that, and you will be able to target Android and then just replace uh, the Windows underscore VC160 for Android, and you will have pre-make working, and you will have build working at the same time. Awesome. And I like to think of, so just I like to think of uh, debug profile and release as levels yeah. of accessibility. So debug, I have mm -hmm. the most accessibility to debug and understand what's happening uh, in the code. Uh, in the profile build, uh, I can get information from WISE uh, through the profiler, or, or information can be profiled, um, but I can't necessarily step through the code using a debugger, whereas the release version then does not have profiling capability, does not have debugging capability. It's strictly optimized for a release version um, without any of that other stuff that you would use during development. Does that sound right? Yeah. In this case, the release and even the profile, you can you can always debug because we generate the debug uh, symbols with all that setup. The thing is, it's just harder because some of those part of the code that in debug are going to be as is once it's compiled are going to be a bit rearranged to make it uh, faster, essentially. Great. So what you're going to see in the debugger, it might not be what exactly is going on uh, as you would have intended, but it's still going to uh, output the same result. It's just compiler getting smart on you. <laughs> Great. Great. Um, so, uh, but you're right. In essentially, what we ship for, a, for other people to use is the release version. So the one, uh, and we don't ship the symbols, so they really cannot debug. These guys can't, but you can still. If, there's a bug there. Um, if, if it's your first time doing this, like you say you haven't done any programming, pro you don't really need the difference of like what is a debug, a release, whatever. If I just need to make something in WISE right now, which one should I choose? Debug? Uh, debug is a good start, at least for debugging, because if you want to go and, and step through your code. Uh, yeah. If you want to actually use it directly in WISE, though, uh, you mm -hmm. will have to uh, use the authoring first, the uh, authoring target, and you will have to use the release one because the release uh, version of the authoring is the only one you have. You don't have a debug mm -hmm. version. Of really. So yeah. you, there's a there's a neat trick to actually change the optimization level and get rid of that that uh, mumbo jumbo of compiler getting smart. Uh, mm -hmm. I can definitely show you uh, that if you're interested. Um, and it's going to be in Visual Studio. So let me just go ahead uh, and show that here I'm building release. That's how you would do it. Mm -hmm. And uh, I need to specify, though, the architecture because uh, the authoring can be built using either Visual Studio 2015, 2017, or 2019. So here I'm using, again, 2019. So thank and yet you. again, if Double you forget two. about that, the help will tell you you need to add that. It will give you an error message saying you need that. Yeah, like I'm glad. I'm glad it did. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Otherwise, I uh, wouldn't forget. So we have those solutions for authoring, and I'm just going to show you how to disable the optimization if you want to uh, debug. And that's because that's the only way to to have a debug kind of version for the authoring, and that's probably where you're going to start. Um, I opened the solution, and at the right, right here, I got uh, that um, that project. Is the without the effects here is the front end part, so the one that's going to be in the authoring, and that's the sound engine part. Uh, that's the, the the place we're going to focus in, and has the DSP. So you can make that right click on that project, go to properties, and in C C plus plus. Here, they are, there's a section optimization. And you can see that here it's disabled already. Oh, so that's useful. You don't even need to change it. Uh, however, if you want to, uh, oh, but that's because I'm in debug. Ha, 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 that's why. 
<laughs> Thanks. Um, so here we're going to see the half favor speed, but we want the other one, right? We want the disable. So you can just change it and do disable. And as long as you don't rerun pre-make, it's going to stay like that. And you're going to be able to test it and do breakpoints and all that stuff. So uh, just so you know, for reference. Great. So we're working with, go back. with two, uh, two pieces of the gain plugin that we're working on. We're working on the sound engine piece and the authoring piece. Uh, those were all created using the pre-make step. Exactly. And we're off to the races. Yeah. And I actually just built the authoring part using the same principle as I use for Windows. And so what does that do? It basically outputs my DLL, so that's what the authoring uses, into that directory it tells you right here. And authoring x64 release bin plugins, and that's where it outputs it. And that's where all the other plugins are. And so if we were to run WISE right now, create a project, you would see your own plugin already in WISE, ready to be used. You can um, actually do that. And we're actually um, going to do that. The, the the interesting part about this is uh, whatever version of wp.py that you choose uh, and that you run your script with, it knows authoring is there. It's it, it just nearby. So you install the SDK and you install the authoring at the same step, and it's in the same folder. So it will automatically generate things for your authoring. So if you run authoring right now, the, ver the same version that you used for WP.py, you have your plugin. And it's there. Yeah. Is anyone following <laughs> along at home? Uh, does anyone have their own plugin showing up in Wise? I'd love to see some hands up in that chat room. Uh, like, mm -hmm. way to go. We have gotten this far together. Uh, excellent work. I see, I see our plugin. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And we have just a placeholder right here. That's a property we can, we're can actually going to use as a game. Because we want to do a game, right? Remember, <laughs> almost forgot about that. And so, so far, it does nothing. It really just, it's there. Uh, but uh, when I play back, it's, it's doing nothing to the sound. Uh, so I can actually add some signs so you can see uh, that there's something here. Hey, we got one hand up. Put it yeah. In infinite. <laughs> You don't have sound, but I can tell you nothing's happening. At least the meter doesn't show that it's moving, right? <laughs> sure, sure. So it's not a game yet. Well, we're going to get there. <clears throat> um, I've already mentioned there are those two folders, right? So the WISE is the authoring part, and the Sound Engine plugin is the Sound Engine part, the DSP. And so today, we're going to play around in that Sound Engine part. Uh, if you guys already saw the one minute WISE, um, We've already uh, used that property right here. Um, and we've actually made some changes to it just to make it more, uh, well, usable in terms of UI. So the first thing is that a game usually works um, in, uh, in DB. So you change a rate from, for example, minus 96 DB to maybe zero or, or, or 10 if you want to add uh, some more, uh, some more game, and so um, I know Mads, you have already done that, and it's being done in the XML, which interestingly is not under Sound Engine plugin, and that's one part I did not exactly explain. It's how the properties that we had back in our uh, in our schema here, um, how the properties get to be defined there. There's a part in the code that's for sure, but there's also a part that the authoring reads to get to know those. And those two have to be in sync. That's how, uh, that's how it works. So in WISE plugin, there's this file, the plugin, so it's the name of my plugin, that XML. So it might be uh, my plugin, that XML on your side. And uh, it was generated with that property. That's how we're going to call it, a property. With a name dummy, in this case, the default one, a certain type and uh, some other elements like a range. Um, in this case, I think a range uh, of 0 0.01 and to 1,000 is might be a big big for a DB <laughs> scanning of a game. <laughs> um, so we we'll probably want to put something like minus 96, right, and, and 0. How does that sound? 
plus 10, plus 10. Oh, plus 10, actually, plus 10 that. because it's a gain, so you can also gain oh, sure. the volume, right? Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. And call it gain. Uh, gain didn't make sense. Nice. Um, I'm actually going to keep that name just for time. You can change it, but I'll have to change it in the code if I do that. I'm just going to change the display name. And that's the thing you see in what. So uh, that's for now what, what's interesting. Uh, there's a couple of stuff for the user interfaces, and I'm not going to go over too much today, but I'm definitely going to link you to um, the page documentation about properties. And so there's a whole bunch of documentation you can read about for all of those values you can put in the XML. Uh, and there's one specific one that uh, is going to be uh, useful today is the um, data meaning right here. So the data meaning allows you to use a, a specific scaling for that slider in wise. So DB scaling is different from just linear scaling because the, the linear representation scales differently from the number. And so here we're just going to specify data meaning uh, in this exact same way as if you want a, a reference, it's done in the sample right here. So we've got inside the property tag, there's an attribute data meaning with a value uh, in this case, it's decibel, exactly what we want. I'm just going to copy paste that directly into my property. Could be anywhere into uh, into that line. And so now, magically, it's going to be understood by why it's as a decibel. And that's how it's going to be uh, represented in the UI when you play around with it. So that's useful. Um, however, in the sound engine part, so we're now we're going to dive into the sound engine part. We have uh, two main elements, so, and that's the same thing as we had previously in the in the schema. We have the wargain effects, which is essentially that plugin part here, and we have the wargain effects uh, params, which are parameters. And uh, as far as the params are concerned, uh, we have not changed the type. It's exactly the same thing. It's the same name. We won't change it. So so far so good, but. In the DSP part, we're going to have to handle it as a decibel. So we're going to see how we did that. And Mads actually did it. So, yeah. Can you, yeah, to, just, to, just while we're here, can you explain a bit about why, what's the difference between a H and a CPP file? Like, oh, yeah. Why are you visiting those CPP files? And, like, yeah. Yeah. Uh, actually, maybe a good example would be uh, directly in the Wise SDK. Uh, the Wise SDK has um, that folder that's called include. And if you're working like me in a Visual Studio, you're going to need to add it. And what does this file have? Well, this folder has is all the headers. Uh, the headers are definitions of what the functions are. So it's their list. It's a signature. It has like all the one, all the, the functions you, you want to use. You include essentially that file into yours can be a CPP or that H. And now you have access to whatever's in that file. Um, so for example, here I have my login effects that CPP and I include a configuration file right here. And that configuration file defines some, uh, some values. So my company ID, my plugin ID. Um, and that's those are values that I need to set if I ever want to publish it uh, elsewhere. I can put one, two, three, for example. And so now I can see that in my file that includes it, the login, it's referenced somewhere. And so it can be used. And that's why. If you don't include it, then you don't have access to it. And for what it's worth, you can go to the documentation for the company ID and plugin ID, and you can actually register those. So the, the reason why it's num numerical, it's just it's easier for us to maintain. But we have a list of company IDs. That way, if you ever decide to create a plugin and publish it, just before pub publishing it, you just uh, go there, ask us, tell us that we I need a company ID. And we will send you one, even if you don't have a company. By the way, it's just so we <laughs> people don't don't uh, don't step on each other. Yeah, exactly. And why, why? Why? What is that needed for in the end? That ID. Uh, the the reason is simple: is uh, we take these numbers, and when we say we want to 
create the gain FX plugin, we don't tell that. We tell uh, we want to create the plugin one, two, three from company 64. And authoring will automatically take that and figure out it's your plugin. Uh, otherwise, we need to look at names, and it looks really simple looking at names. It's really, really simple. But the problem with names, when you have a project with 10,000 uh, sounds and each of them has four effects and you have all these hierarchies and everything, then it starts to take a really long time. And <laughs> since these are actually done at real time during your gameplay, uh, we prefer to actually use uh, IDs like this. So it's it's just a matter of making sure that the sound engine part is as quick as possible and efficient as possible. Exactly. So if you have more than one plugin that you're creating on your side, you might see that they're going to step on each other because the default value is zero. Just change that value that I showed in your config file right there to whatever. Uh, it's just going to work. Uh, then why is it going to see two plugins and not just one? Um, and so I did mention the, and the XML, that is true. Thank you for reminding me. So in the XML, let's do it. Put one, two, three, right? There's a plugin ID field right there in effect plugin. Woo! Almost. <laughs> one, two, three. And now everybody is going to agree that one, two, three is our what game, the most awesome game in the world. Um, including those files uses the include a uh, macro, let's call it, or preprocessor definition. And uh, you do need to have that include uh, setting up, set up. So if you're using Visual Studio directly, it's already going to be there. If you're using Visual uh, Studio Code like me, you can, uh, there's a CPP properties config. You can look that up on Google. And basically, it, all you need to do is add that one file. Um, and it's going to be. the folder for SDK include, that include folder, that's what it means. <laughs> we want to include that, all that stuff in there. And we could add it in the include path list right there. And so I have a couple of others to add just because I need to set it up for the first time. And some of those are the compiler and the Windows SDK kit. So oh. this looks weird. However, if you know that ID and if you are used to running in VS Code and are actually used in doing C++ or C or any kind of programming inside VS Code, this is purely VS Code. It has nothing to do with us. It's simply to make sure that we can get the proper information on the screen. But it has nothing to do with the plugin itself. Exactly. And you so, can you can do it without this. It's just this just makes it easier to work with it, right? Exactly. Because right now, yeah. see, I had those squiggles. Now I don't anymore, and I can just hit F12 and go see what's in that file. That's going to be useful, definitely. Mm -hmm. um, so back to our to our shoes. Um, and this setup got, this setup's in Visual Code that you're pushing through right yeah. now, Samuel. Great. Yeah, exactly. So some of those. So some of you work. Uh, for example, in other language or might be used uh, to VS Code. I just wanted to show that ad additional part of configuration. Mm -hmm. So you're all set up from there. Uh, you can even use directly the uh, the uh, terminal in VS Code, as long as you're in the right folder, ah. uh, to do your WP stuff. So that's that's quite useful. And all uh, of so these, you can never leave that. And way. all of these steps are already done in, in Visual Studio. Is that correct? Yes, it is. Uh, yeah. Everything is done in Visual Studio. Uh, the the thing about Visual Studio Code is you can do Python, you can do Lua, you can do whatever kind of language inside VS Code. You, you can work on Mac, you can work anywhere. You can even do remote compiling with this. So it's it's really awesome because you can work uh, in any given kind of configuration. But the, the drawback with this is VS Code doesn't know about your particular system and how it's set up at your moment. It doesn't look at the, the solution for Visual Studio and tells, oh, yeah, that's right. IntelliSense, you can use that, and you can go inside there, and the files are already there. It doesn't know all of these 
things. So Visual yeah. Studio 2019 will actually have all the path set up as long as you follow correctly the, the instruction and how to install it. Obviously, exactly. obviously, if you install something in some other folder, it will not know about this. So you still need, but in our case, yes, everything is already is already there. So no big deal. Yeah, and what's fun is that WP already knows about those paths. So we just call it through the command line. It just, it just works. So it's just for our little local setup right here. And so I've just shown you one uh, typical error that people will do, uh, and I do all the time is that you're going to try to build the authoring part of your plugin, and then it says, cannot open file. Why is that? Um, because why is it still running? It has that plugin loaded right now. And so it doesn't want you editing it while it's using it. So that does mean that you have to close wise before you can rebuild, and then you have to reopen wise, and it's going to reload that new version you just compiled. Now I'm just going to rerun it, demonstrate that it works. Don't worry, it's not it's not broken. You haven't screwed up your setup. It's just close wise. <laughs> what are you doing when you're um, rerunning it? What magic button are you pressing? I'm just going to the launcher. <laughs> no, 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 no. The, Trust the, 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 up the, arrow. the VS Code up arrow. side, yeah. Right, right, right. Yeah. Uh, if you it if you hit up, it, it takes the last command that you just ran, ah. and it goes. There's a history right there of all the commands I previously did. Great. So you've got a command already loaded in uh, that has all the arguments for uh, building the release authoring plugin side. And, exactly. And you were just up arrowing back to an argument you had already made and mm -hmm. whacking on it to iterate. Exactly. Great. So you can always set up tasks, but that's, that's just a subject for another time. Uh, and Visual Studio can just hit Control Shift B. It's going to build the whole solution. It's going to do the same thing. Um, uh, there's one question about writing an executable to just automatically restart Wise, and the answer is with WAPI you could. Yeah. You can actually connect to your Wise integration and disconnect that and quit your wise. I think the quit command is there. And what there's a quit command. Yeah. Yes. yeah. And then it will do it. And then you relaunch it. So you can actually do it if you wish. Uh, it, it will be a really good idea to actually have that. But the problem, the problem with wise and WAPI is you usually have only one instance of wise uh, with WAPI. So if you were to run multiple instances, for example, doing coding and whatever in one instance and having another one to actually do your sound design and the sound design being the one open that will be closed so it's there's there's a few drawbacks to webpy but yes it can be done for someone coding yeah and and webpy is the wise authoring api that is a way you can interact with your authoring like the wise itself from python code for example and such so you can make small commands that does something like import sounds directly into Wise instead of uh, using using the importer. So in that same way, you can use the edit to exit and uh, open Wise. Exactly. Pro. Uh, for opening Wise, of course, you you can't connect to WebP because there's no Wise process. Oh, yeah, running. true. Yeah. <laughs> there, there's just this part, but the rest is absolutely true. And you can you can yeah. edit your project even through that. Uh, so you could. Great commands in Visual Studio Code, do that uh, and, and share it with the people. <laughs> so we're trying to do a game, right? Let's do it. Um, we have our plugin. We're here in that plugin part. What gain effects? And um, I'm just not going to close that. Um, we have our execute function, You know that function right here. And that's what WISE calls for. Uh, doing processing some mathematical operators on your buffer, so the audio stream. It gives you, as an argument to that function, the stream as an audio buffer, has some properties, some stuff. It's an instance of a class. And you can use it then to apply whatever we want to do right here. Um, Matt, were you? Uh... And, and yeah, I just want to mention that it, this is in the FX, like whatever you call the plugin, fx.cpp file. So, so just search for that file and then scroll down to almost the button where you find the execute function. Um, just to, yeah, 
those following yeah. can for, for real coder here and people that actually uh, <laughs> make a living out of that this is the place you wish to actually optimize your stuff uh, this is what will get executed in your game. So the longer this takes, the longer your plugin will take to execute in the final product. Uh, so make sure that you actually optimize these. And uh, t let me tell you, it's not as trivial as it seems. But for a basic plugin, for whatever most people are actually doing, it's actually all right. It's only when you have dozens of instances or hundreds on some on some iOS device like a iPhone 6s that's five years old and whatever. Then you wish to really optimize your your things. So uh, this is the place where you wish to actually take your programming skills and mathematical skills and actually apply that to making this as efficient as possible. Yeah, so what does uh I'll go ahead. Then. I was going to say so buffer, right? It's buffer. you're talking you used it interchangeably with the word uh streaming uh data stream data or data stream yeah. buffer and again it's I think of it like a bucket that audio goes into and then this execute command is where the magic happens. Uh it rearranges the data in that buffer and then pushes it back out the other side. Does that sound right? Yeah, uh, well, it's a holder of that data. Right? Yeah. Um, and so it, that bucket is a good, uh, it's a good word for it. Uh, it really owns all of that data for a frame. So a set of ah. sample. And uh, so you're going to work with that frame during that execution. Yep. Uh, the buffer offers a couple of stuff. Uh, for you to know what's in there. Mm -hmm. uh, you have the number of channels, which can be anywhere from one to a lot. Yep. Uh, and you can access each channel as a set of, of essentially, uh, in this case, it's, uh, it's float, floating points. So each sample being one variable, one value. And uh, you have a maximum number that's defined uh, by the number here that is also provided by the uh, IOP buffer right here, U valid frame. So that's the number of, of, uh, of frames essentially you can use um, Great. or samples. Great. Um, if you want to see what's in IOP buffer, you can definitely go and have a look at AK audio buffer. If you've set up all your stuff correctly, hitting F12 would go to directly the header that defines it. And so we were talking about a class earlier, that's a class. So that class has functions that are defined like this and data that's defined doo -doo 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 at the bottom typically like this. So a variable type and then some name. And then that name, that's what we can refer to. Uh, we saw that the valid frame right here is right here. And question, and access, question from the chat, are frames yes. the same as samples? Um, I like to think that a frame is a set of samples. Am I right? <laughs> uh, actually, no. The, the the frame in our in our case is one sample for all the channels. Bingo. Mm. So it's uh, it's a little bit different. Yeah, it's a, it's mostly a sample. It yeah. took me uh, some time to actually figure that out too. <laughs> Nomenclature. <laughs> yeah, this is this is what happens when you have a twenty-year-old product. So people start using it. People start actually liking that, and uh, you you have to decide whether you change something, some nomenclature that people are used to have, and break everyone's code for new people because it actually makes more sense or do you keep it as legacy and you just keep that uh, like before so mm -hmm. the, the the case of frame there could be a debate but technically one frame is one uh, one sample you are right yeah it's 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 interchangeable yeah interchangeable yeah perfect uh, most of the time thanks for the question and thanks for clarifying yeah so let's keep using frames because that's what that's what it's uh, referred to so i'm going to say frames um, so we want to go through each of those frames, uh, essentially that P buffer right here, and uh, change the value that it, that it has. Uh, we're going to have to get comfortable with pointers because um, we're not actually using variables. We're using pointers to those to that data, essentially. And you see that the AK audio buffer has a dat star, and that's the, the, what denotes it as a pointer. So instead of having 
a copy of all that data that we saw here. So all of those elements that are encompassed into that instance, instead of having a copy of that, we're just having a value here that points to the position in data that has that data, hmm. the, the position in memory that has that data. And so whatever we change in that buffer is going to affect whatever um, passed it on to us. So that's how the in-place buffer works. We modify that, the data contained in there, and then why is that called us and provided that buffer is just going to uh, well, use it for passing it over perhaps to the next effect and then essentially just mix in it and, and put it in the sink. Um, the out of uh, place has two of those. So we you would have technically to copy data from one to the other. And of course, that takes a bit more time. Uh, so we're, that's why we're, we've gone with the in place right now that has only a single one. Um, when you want to access uh, the data that's in the buffer, um, what we're doing here is we're going through each channel based on the number of channels that this function right here that we call returns. We assign it here. And we're using a for loop to go over each of those number of channel. And using i, which is the iterator, first loop is going to be 0, because that's how we initialize it. Second loop is going to be 1, because we increment it. And we do that until it reaches number of channel, once it's incremented. Then we, we stop and we go here. First loop, as I said, it was 0. And we use it here as a variable to access the buffer that's pointing for that channel in the buffer. So it's like a sub, sub element of buffer uh, in our, our full audio buffer. And we assign it here as a pointer of load, a real 32. And that's what we want to use and modify. Now that this is a this is great that all of this is here for those that aren't a programmer beforehand, right? Uh, the, like all these kind of running through the different samples and such, you don't need to change all these things. You just need to change a simple thing afterwards inside these loops, but just know how it functions. And yes, what I always love about this part of it, right, is that we're we are breaking down what happens during one frame, right? One like. <laughs> split second uh, of a moment in time and this loop that you're talking about is you know that part that is traveling a million miles an hour at runtime but that we can see very clearly um, what that process is that's being executed and that process that will take what we want to do and build it into that process so exactly the and everything that is arcane in this is probably for a good reason it's probably to optimize things uh, again uh, all of this is used internally by us too uh, if you were to look at one of our plugin for example the samples we the ak delay plugin is actually the one that you have on your machine when you install wise so that's exactly the same plugin but all of that is for uh, best efficiency and best optimization so this mm. is why it's a little bit weird sometime i'm 20 year old so yeah <laughs> yeah so uh, again if you want to see the exact you see there's that effects suffix that are right there that delay that michelle was just talking about the execute function is doing something similar it's uh, in the process there. That's another function in another file that does that process, but it, it still has to go. It still has to go through all that thing, and there's a lot more code because it's optimized with this IMD, which we're not gonna cover today, right? <laughs> it's my eyes. It's all about stuff, but it's a good reference. Uh, <laughs> instead, we're just gonna focus on here what a game does. Great. Okay. What a game exactly is acting on the data. It takes a sample, a frame, and it changes, it multiplies it by a ratio, essentially. Um, what we use as parameters was a dB, uh, a dB value. Here, it's a lot easier to process that as a linear value. So again, the difference between linear and, uh, and uh, dB and the logarithmic scale uh, has to be obvious to some of you. Maybe some of you are, 
or it's not that obvious. We can go on the Wikipedia to see it. <laughs> uh, one, one good way to actually explain the difference between these values, uh, linear values and logarithmic values, is sometimes you will have a volume on one of your machine that whenever you start running it and cranking it up, it just does nothing, does nothing, does, and then eventually it starts just boosting the volume and boosting the volume really quickly. And you don't know why you don't, you don't have control. You move it a tiny little bit and everything changes. But in some parts of the volume, you just move it a lot and you don't have any changes. So that is not the logarithmic volume. The logarithmic volume is more about how your ear processes things. And this is why we have the dB. So if you wish to actually double the, the volume, you have to double the number of dBs. Well, it's time, times three, but anyways. So yeah, it's just a, a simple a simple mathematical step to go through all of these. Exactly. Um, so um, what we want to do basically is just the first element is access a parameter. Uh, the parameter that we have was called dummy, and we want to just multiply it basically by uh, the the sample, the, the frame uh, value of the float here. So I was just here. We have the buffer that represents the channel. And then after that, we go through all the frames uh, that we can process. And so here with the buffer, what you want to do is access the value that's in there and change it. And to do that, uh, I think, Matt, uh, you had the, uh, I'm probably just going to have to copy exactly your code. Uh, just to make sure <laughs> that I, I'm using the yeah, exact thing. Use the, uh, like, just the, the like you have the, uh, the array, and then I just take the U frames processed like an index from the array and mm -hmm. equals the same thing and then multiplies it so that exactly. I gain it or subtract it from it. Oh, yeah. Yeah, uh, I did. I did not start with uh, actually explaining what are the parameters. So that's I just wanted to go uh, with things in order. <laughs> and yeah, sure. uh, yeah uh, in, when you init your plugin, when this thing gets called, uh, you got the parameters right here that get set into your um, essentially a, a member function. Uh, you were in the CPP, and that header right here. Uh, we see all the functions that I mentioned earlier that exactly it's the same as we saw in the AK audio buffer. And we have the members here. So that's the variables that you have access always in all of your functions that are uh, within your class. So you know that you're within your class because you have the name of your class, uh, two, two columns, and then the name of the function. And so anything that's in there, and we mark it with the M to say that's a member. And that has been assigned to you. So that MP, that param, uh, yeah, MP params is essentially a, what represents your parameters. And that's how you get to access your, uh, your parameters. So let's just start by accessing. That's going to be a lot simpler. Um, in the parameters, uh, we had a set of um, RTPC or non RTPCable. Uh, Right. Yeah, properties that I'm actually going to show you directly instead. Um, cool. Right here, we had the dummy here. And that thing was read by that class, that param class. So quickly, it's the same, that, that process here, the parameter block that gets read and, uh, and produces the parameters. Uh, that value is under RTPC. Oops, and gets assigned a value when it gets read through set param block. So that's the parameter block right here. We read bank as a real 32, so the float, because that's how it's defined in the XML and also in the struct. And we assign that value here to have them. For what it's worth, uh, everything that's called Wagain is our code. So this is something that yes. got created for us and that we can change easily and we should change because the name dummy is actually not a good name, but for now it, <laughs> it, it's, it's worthwhile. <laughs> uh, but this, this is actually done by WP.py. When you create your project, it creates this file for you. Uh, and inside that, we have all the functions to actually read things and to uh, get the, the proper data. So uh, 
try the, these are the things that you need to actually understand in order to make uh, the, the your plugin so when you act when we say we actually uh, get the params it's not something that audio kinetic actually provides it's something that wp.py created for you and you can change and add whatever parameters that you actually wish to have inside that yeah just like just like a user said in the chat that uh, I love uh, that all the function and calls already are set are there, so just have a, to fill in the blanks, right? So the thing is that everything is there. You just need to pick in certain things at certain points, and and you can experience that in your in yeah. WISE. Um, believe me when I say that we work really hard so the blanks are lesser and lesser because the first blanks <laughs> for 2018 were huge. Sure. Um, now uh, nothing was created for you. The params, the share, the FX, nothing was created for you. Mm -hmm. You had a blank slate and some kind of instruction and here, go. <laughs> so that, that, mm -hmm. that, got, uh, that is much better and we are trying to make it uh, even easier. Uh, you first told us, Damien, uh, about uh, what is our dream plugin. And the reason we are doing this and we are working uh, a lot on making it easier, actually, right now it's, it's quite hard yet again, but we are still working on this. Uh, and the goal is so that people can actually create more plugin so they can create their dreams. And then all the accessibility stuff I was ta talking about and all the ideas I have, I I'm sure I'm not the only one that uh, that has these uh, those ideas. So if people can actually create their own plugins and it's easier for them to understand, then we've made we've made great progress. That's the dream. <laughs> yes. Perfect. Yeah. Perfect. Uh, it, so, yeah, it makes me feel like we're almost there. Uh huh. Yeah. 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 Um, and so uh, now that we know where the params, because I was about to write that without explaining it, but now we know where the params are. And we can access it through, because it's a pointer in arrow, so a, a dash and a uh, bigger than, greater than uh, sign. And then that's a struct that's directly there. So that's why we use a point. It's not a pointer, even though it sounds like point, pointer. Um, we have that value that's going to be set and read, essentially, by, <clears throat> uh, uh, well, in the sound banks and set when we initialize the parameters by that function, set param blocks. Um, here, and so we can assume that the value that user set in the project and has been built in the sound banks is going to be uh, put in that variable. And so when I was playing it around with that slider, that's what is going to change uh, uh, at each execution while I slide uh, my slider. Um, so how do, we, uh, how do we actually multiply something by this value? Um, here we have the buffer. And the way to do it is essentially because this is a, a, a pointer to a, a spot in the memory, what we can do is access a, a, a certain indexed spot. So the, uh, each of those um, AK real 32, we can go through the full buffer by just going to the first one. So the one at index zero, and it's going to be zero because first we initialize that variable here to zero. and so we can use that indexer uh, to specify the index at which I want to have the real 32, that float variable, that frame. And at each, um, at each iteration of that while, I'm going to increment that variable and just take the next one. So first one's going to be 0. Then that variable is going to be 1. So I'm going to access the one next in that points in the memory to the real 32 buffer. Second is going to be the second one and blah, blah, blah. And so we're just going to go through into that doo -doo -doo, that list of frames yeah. until we reach the maximum valid frames that we can do process. Uh, for, uh, yeah, exactly, for, for, because all the channels have the same amount. So that's why we, we always use the same valid frame. It's not per channel. Um, so here we have a multiplication. Uh, that's fine, but we need to assign it somewhere. So that definitely gives us a result. 
that's uh, the number here times the frame uh, at that spot. And what we can do, because this is a pointer, we can assign that result in the same variable here. So we're essentially doing something like, like that. Uh, that would be the shorthand. So let me write it exactly like you did, uh, Max. <clears throat> um, and the only last element that we need to do, uh, and that's common in audio in audio programming, that's why we, we're showing it, is that because the value here in the authoring was set to be a DB, and we actually want to multiply it simply without any hassle, so it's, it's actually going to uh, be transferred into a linear uh, version, so we can simply multiply it and apply it, and that's going to give us the result we want. Uh, the function that Matt's use is the one that we provide uh, with the SDK. That's akdb2lin, lin being linear. And so I'm just going to quickly go in and find it to show you what it does exactly. And that's like we can go in Wikipedia, and that's what I, was, <laughs> I wanted to show you earlier. Mm -hmm. um, we're taking some formula that just transform it. It's basically. 10 to the dB value divided by 20, so times 0 0.05, it's the same thing. And that's what it does. So we're just taking the dB value, converting to linear, and multiplying to each and every sample, each and every frame, until there is no more to process, and that's it. And so you basically got the same information by just hovering on the AKDB tooling. Oh, that's true, yeah. exactly, yeah. yeah. Long yeah. live VS Code. <laughs> it's probably going to be the same thing in Visual Studio, though, to be honest. I, I think it does the same in Visual Studio. Ah, great. All right. Um, and so that's basically one line we did, right? That's the only thing we did, plus the XML uh, that we specified that it was a linear and specified the max and min range so far. So let's build and see how it does. And, and what I love is that, you know, as we talk more about it, it, it really is a set of building blocks that you string together. Uh, Many of those building blocks already exist. Uh, you're inserting this at a place where Wise knows to look for it, knows to evaluate it, knows to do um, what you're specifying. Uh, and the functionality is already in place. The mechanisms are already in place to allow for that. So. You know, there's so much already there that what you need to bring to this process, I feel like, as a as someone who is wading into plugin creation for the first time, is you need to bring your inspiration, bring your goal to this process, and and really just uh, arrive ready to give it a try, uh, and to continue trying until it works. Uh, because I think where there's a will, there's a way, and uh, wow, yeah, I see it working. Yeah. So you see the scaling of that value is seems linear to us because that's a that's a dB scaling right here, and to the sound scale that's also uh, in dB. It's also a linear when we go uh, from a metering point of view, but of course the actual multiplication is linear, and so that's what our plugin does. And essentially, that's that's it. We have a game. <laughs> and are there, there are any limitations to where you can put this game at the moment? Like you can put it on any audio bus, right? And sound as effects Indeed. and so on, right? Exactly. So you yeah. you can set in the XML all those requirements if your plugin can only work, for example, on a bus or can only work in some kind of a uh, some kind of way. You can look at. Uh, look into the XML properties page and see where you can put all the dependencies. But essentially, as far as the code is concerned, in effect, and that's what we saw earlier in the uh, that sketch right here, was that um, it, it's all it's all just nodes of those types, right? And the effect can mm -hmm. be inserted on any kind of uh, places in the pipeline. And actually, if I add it in the uh, master bus. And I see in the profiler, start the profiler and play. So you see that there are indeed, uh, it, it's exactly as in this, uh, except we have multiple effects. And those correspond to the voices, uh, well, one voice and uh, the different objects that are uh, have that effect inserted. So it goes through two instances. And so that means that in your plugin, that execute function is going to be called with one buffer that's going to be processed first by this one. 
and then gave back two eyes, given back two eyes, and another instance of your plug is going to receive that the result of what has processed here and do the same thing until it's output to the mm. system. Uh, yeah. Awesome. By, by default, by default, we provide everything through RTPC because we feel that people actually wish to change these values dynamically. <laughs> but sometimes you might wish to put this in non-RTPC, and then in doc documentation, you have that to actually constrain the values to something. For example, if you change a frequency of a file you save, you cannot RTPC the frequency of the file you save. So if you wish to save a 44 kilohertz file, you cannot start RTPCing that value. So that will make sense to actually have it in a non-RTPC value. Mm -hmm. So uh, mostly, mostly one, one of the things that I want to mention I want to have is if people were following along with the product, with the, the project uh, Samuel did, uh, he created the file, he added the, the plugin, but the plugin, when he saved and he relaunched, the plugin was not there anymore. And that is one of the side effect of using the company ID and plugin IDs. Because these value changed, the plugin disappeared. So you must make sure that it's actually there. I also just did not save. <laughs> sure. There's that. Because <laughs> sure. uh, it's still going, it's actually still going to be there. But it's going to be shown as like non installed. Yeah. And so uh, you would have to, uh, as you said, you would have to delete it and then re-put it because it's not going to be yeah. the same plugin to us. Yeah. Hmm. So once you have set it, uh, keep it that way. <laughs> uh, the reason why the delay time is a non-RTPC is because of, uh, in, the, in the questions in the, in the, the chat, uh, is uh, simply because of the algorithm we are using. Uh, so when you change the delay, what happens if, if you have a, a pedal, uh, if you have a pedal board and you change the delay, you will not notice it glitches all the time whenever you change that delay. So if you are ready to actually live with that, that glitching, then it could actually make sense. But for us, it made no sense to actually make it non-RTPC. But you could create one plugin that actually does it. That's the beauty of it, or fix ours. <laughs> uh, just change the company ID, uh, just change the things. It's in the sample. It's free to use, so enjoy doing it and changing it for, uh, for your own needs. Yeah. And we can see the reason why. Uh, I think it. Uh, I was not using the, the right one, but one is, once it's set, essentially, it's, it's just uh, it's never it's never used to, um, it's not using the same value there that, that could be changed. It's using a copy of it. And so that's why uh, each instance will have that, that value initially set. Mm -hmm. uh, awesome. And so, of course, that's just a self-imposed uh, restriction. Maybe that's, that's what I wanted to, to go uh, there. Um, you said if it's an RTP symbol or not. And basically, it's not, it doesn't have to be in two groups. It could be in the same, but it's just an easier way for, for us to uh, arrange a group of stuff that's not RTP symbol and stuff that is, mm -hmm. right? It's uh, to visualize things. That's just, what we know. Exactly. But you still have to end it. Wow. Uh, an excellent <laughs> overview of plugin creation. Uh, well handled, Samuel, Michelle, great uh, perspectives throughout. And Mads, love the way you set it up there uh, from time to time. Uh, Want to run that one minute video and just give people a quick snapshot of how that looks at super speed? Yeah, let's let's do that. And I can also show you the one minute wise just to give you insight some where you can find stuff. Great. So I'll take over the intro, uh, presentation here. Uh, let's see if uh, like this does this work. I think it worked. Good, so you see my computer. Right, sound on here. And uh, I just want to mention before we do this that uh, in the bottom here, in the uh, just below the video, you can see a description here. And this is the uh, same applies for every one minute wise video. I try as much to like fill it up with a lot of links so you can get further once you've been seeing the video and they have a lot of questions, then you can explore this afterwards. And down here, you can see some resources. For example, there's where to get the Visual Studio, where to get Python, 
the explanations for uh, what solution you need to open with what Visual Studio version. But there's also some uh, good things for inspiration. Um, there's this uh, Sam Mackey's Wise plugin GitHub that uh, Damien talked about also. Uh, so a lot of go good resources here that you can just go exploring. Uh, and if anything's missing, make sure to uh, let us know. So let's watch the one minute wise and feel free to ask any questions while it's running. Let's create a simple wise game plugin. To do so, create a new plugin, add some processing code and map it to a property, then build and use it in wise. But before we do so, start by installing Python with these libraries, Visual Studio with this Windows SDK version, and WISE along with the platforms you need it for. We'll just be making a WISE game plugin for authoring. Okay, let's navigate to the directory of where you want to create the plugin. Then access command prompt like this. Then create a new plugin based on this VP file from your WISE version. Choose effect and pre-make it, which creates a solution we can use with Visual Studio. Here, in the XML, we've got this dummy property that remains to be used for something. Let's use it to control the gain level. So in the fxcpp file, in execute, let's multiply the samples with the dummy property. And for proper db scaling, convert the multiplication like this, add a disable flag in the XML, and change the value restriction. OK, so set it to release, save, and build it. And then add it to a sound in WISE. That's it. Yeah, that was so good. All right. <laughs> cool. So uh, <laughs> you, can, you can go in and uh, watch it again. Or if you want to watch, watch these things again, remember that all of this is getting uploaded to our YouTube channel and so on. So you can review every step of the way. And you're welcome to ask questions also because if we, whenever we're doing the next one, we want to address those kind of things. Great. Yeah. Uh, you set us up perfectly. Um, there will be more of these. So please let us know what else is interesting. Uh, we have some other ideas, certainly, of where we'd like to take you uh, on this journey of programming uh, plugins in WISE. Uh, and yeah, it's. Uh, I think a rich area to explore for someone who has a vision of something that they want to accomplish in support of the games that they're making. Um, yeah, I, I'm going to throw a line out to some special guests and invite them into uh, a little Q&A session with us. Uh, oh, so surprise. bear with me while I queue this up. Uh, and let's see if we can't get some other folks from the community to drop in on us here and have a chat about what we've been talking about. Uh, this is the improvisational part. If you didn't know, <laughs> everything else was super, you know, on the Oops. rails. Great. I want to know this. Uh, I want to mention here that Damien actually never forget forgot about his mic being closed. <laughs> he actually opened it up at first. I think it's the first one I've seen of all the wise up on the air that he actually never forgot. I, I just jinxed you. Sorry. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> uh, welcome, Megan. Uh, Hey, thanks for uh, hey. thanks for joining us today. Uh, great to have you here as a guest on Wise Up on Air. Uh, and we have one more special guest coming in. Josh, great to see you. Thanks for joining hey, us today. Hey. hey. <laughs> and it's like that. Wow. Uh, everyone's microphone's working and everyone uh, here. Thanks again for joining us here for this quick wrap up 
Um, you, you were following along at home. We appreciate uh, you taking your time to help us out. And now we're looking for some insight from you uh, in real time. Like, how was it? What, uh, what were the high points? What were the new discoveries? Maybe what were some things that, uh, that we didn't clarify enough? Um, and, and just maybe, maybe a better place to start would be give us a little introduction. Um, uh, I moved very quickly from greeting you to this moment. And so let's <laughs> slow things down. And, uh, and why don't you give us a little bit of background? Um, Megan, since you were first to the uh, chat here, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, so uh, I, I'm a sound designer. I've worked a, a little bit with programming. I've built my own audio manager at this point in C Sharp. Um, but I've used Wise before, and it's it's a really great product. Um, I've never done coding with it. I've only used it as a, an extension of just trying to, to, to get the sounds to play. Um, so I, I don't know. I, I, when I was going through and, and just thinking of things that I want to go out and build and, and seeing this, um, I guess the, the one thing, the, the big concept that I'm working on right now is uh, I, I recently got an ambisonic mic and um, I want to do this cave where, you know, you, you have a mono source, which, you know, you're recording this cave from, from a distance. And then as you walk into it, it turns into this ambisonic experience and then passing a parameter that way. Um, I guess using a plugin like this or, or wise as a plugin, like working with those classes and fading a parameter into ambisonics, like I just, is this a plugin related thing or is that more of an engine related thing, I guess? Like, is this, is Unity doing it or is what is, is the sound engine doing it? And I, I guess, I guess I kind of want to pose that question. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, uh, at this point, I think there are multiple approaches to implementing yeah. that. Uh, but I believe that uh, you could definitely like foresee if we're kind of designing this thing with parameters as being like, in this case, for example, the distance from your cave, right? Distance from yeah. X thing. And you have two, uh, two things to uh, mix into. And that like that process of, of that transition could be easily implemented as a DSP effect. I, I would yeah. definitely see it. And then you can control that parameter in the game. So there's, uh, yeah, there's place for having that, that plugin implemented, yeah. Mm. Sweet, <laughs> that's me. <Yeah. sweet. laughs> yeah, I just thought that the it was really interesting just how pre-made it seemed because uh, you know anytime you touch the console, I'm like you know Damien might say that it's it's the Matrix. I'm just like I don't know, that's just scary <laughs> stuff here. Like I, I don't like the console. I, I like Visual Studio is scary enough. So like, <laughs> but cool. Nice. That's nice. good perspective uh, on on both ends. Both the creative vision of like what you might want to try to tackle with it. And also just, um, you know, that those building blocks mm -hmm. are in place to make that path easier, right? Um, Wise is already gray. Visual Studio is already gray, right? These are, they're almost the same tool, mm. uh, at least from a color standpoint, right? <laughs> so it should make it easier to, to step into. That's our hope. Uh, Josh, tell us a little bit about uh, your background and uh, yeah, where where you're coming from. Uh, hey, I'm Josh, and uh, thank you for having me. And I uh, have a YouTube channel and developer community called The Audio Programmer, where uh, I teach people how to get started with making audio plugins. Um, I actually haven't been coding for a very long time myself, um, less than five years. But so I'm actually very much a beginner myself still, but uh, yeah, it's great to be here. And uh, yeah, it's really interesting watching uh, watching this watching this work process and see the differences from uh, the workflows that I've experienced. And uh, there, are, I think once once we actually got into the project and once you had actually created the parameter. And got everything going. The uh, the actual making of the plugin itself 
seemed actually pretty similar to juice not not too not too different um and for folks who don't know what the, juice is uh oh yeah so so juice is a uh so so juice is what's called a framework so for people um, uh, it sounds like there may be a lot of people just getting into programming so i'll explain what a framework is so you have coding language uh, like c plus plus or python then you have what's called a framework. A framework is kind of a purpose-built set of tools that, uh, that that's built on top of a language to help you build a certain thing. So, like, almost, you, you could think of it like Unity or, like, Unreal, but for audio plugins. So it has mm. a set of utility functions and uh, things that you would commonly need to build a plugin, like stuff like MIDI in, MIDI out. And it's also cross Cross platform, so you can build for Windows, um, iOS, Mac, uh, and Android. And uh, yeah, so it's what a lot of commercial plugin, audio plugin developers use to make their plugins. Um, so, do, so, so, do you see the workflow of what we did today being very similar to making plugins in Juice context, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, pretty, hmm. pretty, uh, pretty similar in a lot of ways. Uh, you have a parameter that's sitting in like an XML that has some sort of range and that uh, you need to have that running in your audio loop somehow and you're using a you're using a slider to change what that parameter is uh, you have some sort of initialization function where you're initializing mm -hmm. the values and uh, maybe giving your DSP processes a sample rate or some information that it needs to actually run so mm -hmm. In that sense, it's really quite similar. Uh, I, I think the syntax, uh, the the um, I, I, I think that the syntax of just the framework itself is a bit different, and also it's a little bit more raw in the sense that you have a, a longer setup process that needs to happen. And I think that the, for me, that was probably the most challenging aspect was seeing okay why well, okay mm. i need to have python in order to do this okay so it's just there are a number i think for for a beginner there are a number of different skill sets that need to be in place before uh before they can get into this otherwise it gets confusing because you need to understand pip you know in order uh, to, you, need to, uh. you need to understand okay when you're saying python 2 or python 3 people need to know what what that means <laughs> you need a command prompt yeah yeah and I, and I, yeah. And, and you know you have the command line and then you're saying okay uh, but you're in c plus you know but you're also in c plus plus uh you need to download like the appropriate sdks you need to target these particular os's mm. uh and that and i think that's one of the challenges of being of being an audio in 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 audio development is that there's all of these different intersections of these different things, even stuff like linear versus logarithmic uh, values, you know, trying to explain what that means. Yeah. So trying to fit all of that in to one thing is definitely, it's, it's definitely a big challenge, but I think that build process, just getting, just getting the person into the project where they're actually working on the plugin itself, itself and not so much, trying to just get all of the tools <laughs> into place yeah. Um, yeah because i found that pretty uh pretty challenging to to follow along with there there mm. was a lot there uh and um and that was definitely echoed by megan's trepidation right I, I definitely heard that in what uh you were saying where you know there are a lot of steps uh it's not just like mm. well mm. launching wise is like one button and you're in it Right, mm, yeah. but mm. launching a plugin creation is like step one, two, three, four, five. Yeah. You know, and Mads makes it look easy in that one minute. Like, <laughs> damn, <laughs> right? Boom. Uh, and, it, yeah. and and with the right aptitude, and I think again to to channel Megan, like with the right inspiration, right, with the right desire, and the and the need to support gameplay through you know development of a custom plugin i think people will jump over those hurdles because of the of the mm. power that that comes with it 
Um, yeah. But over time, it does need to get easier. And now, so you've been programming for about five years. VST plugins as a thing, uh, this was a standard created uh, by a, a lot of manufacturers. Am I right? Like the mid 90s, early 90s? Yeah, well, you had Steinberg with the VST standard. Yep. And then uh, you have audio units, which is the Apple standard. Yep. Uh, yeah. So so it's really VST, AU, and then you have the AVID standard, A, yep. AAX, I forget what it stands for. But those are the main three standards that people that people mainly build for. And, I th yeah. and then, yeah, go ahead. Well, I think the cool context there, right, is that if, as we see that evolution on the linear side, right? We see this mm. establishing of a plug-in format, right? Yeah. And now here we are 90, 30 years later, right? And and from your 40? I can't do math. Uh, I'm yeah. Anyway, so so from and from your perspective, we, we have this environment of juice which feels a little bit more out of the box. You're ready to get dirty with plugins uh, for yeah. linear right yeah. and i think that yeah. as an industry game audio uh is still is still back there it's yeah we're still yeah. working towards well, that accessibility that you have today yeah well i mean we've seen you, you and, and i think a great example to see where it could go in the future is uh, i mean look at look at game engines look at unreal and unity in terms of what you can do now versus what you could do 10 years ago uh, yeah. and the possibilities are pretty, pretty mind blowing. Um, you know, in, in terms of progression for audio kinetic and, and wise plugin development, I, I, if, if it were my recommendation, my recommendation would be that in juice, you have this thing called the pro juicer, which is almost like a project manager. And that's a place where uh, you can actually check in the boxes for what systems that you want. Oh, Looks like my Frenchie is uh, joining us for this talk. Uh, <laughs> she's passing through. Wouldn't um, be an audio programmer. It's all yeah. <laughs> yeah. Audio programmer mascot right there. Uh, Dogs of game so audio. Us, yeah, <laughs> to deliver her thoughts. But um, it sounds it sounds like a, a great next progression for Wise would probably be like something like the producer, which is a place where you can pull in external libraries. You can and then you can just easily check in, okay, these are the systems that I'm trying to export for. Um, and, and uh, you know, here are my, here are my different options. And then you just click one button and boom, it opens it up a visual studio or opens it up an Xcode. Sure. And that's it. Uh, and I'm, I know I, c I can't even imagine how long those things take to build, but, uh, if I, I if I can suggest one thing uh, for this, uh, I will do my AK Mike D, uh, Mike Grummel Smith, who usually is the, the the guy that will do these kind of speeches. Uh, we are that many programmer. We are working really hard on the next features all the time. Yeah. Um, we need to change our priorities if people actually wish to us uh, to create more plugins and it's actually something that's uh, worthwhile investing and we believe so i mean uh, in the last years we've been doing uh, years of man hours just uh, I, I don't know what the new term for this but uh, we've been doing yeah exactly so we've been working really really hard on actually making this easier just wp.py is one example but yeah. so many other things so many other aspects but if we if you want if if as developers if as people who use our product you wish us to make something better like that and i totally agree it will be awesome uh, you need to tell us yeah, you you yeah. need to ask uh, Mike D and actually say please, <laughs> please uh, continue on this way because it's actually awesome. Um, yeah. Then we will do it. Flood is in box. <laughs> yeah. yeah, definitely. Uh, you know, I'll say when when I first started about three years ago, um, like I looked at all the job descriptions and all of them were asking for Wise um, middleware or FBOD or or any of these things. And I picked Wise because I, I was basically sitting here going like, okay, so I, I pretty much have to learn one middleware. 
Um, cause it, it seems like it, everyone's asking for it. So mm -hmm. I picked wise, but the main reason why I did was because the documentation with like the series 100, the, the series 200, um, was there. And I think that, that having like these sorts of sessions, especially if they're recorded and put up for, you know, posterity in the future, like making it so easy so that you have that step-by-step, -step, like this is how you set up the plugin and this is what you can do with it. And then letting folks be inspired to do some sort of crazy cave concept, like like that mm. that's that's kind of how it goes, a little bit. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, I agree with that. These these sessions, I think, are definitely the right direction, uh, and that's what it's all about, isn't it? Is is if uh, is is being able to other like Megan was saying, have the documentation there where people can just follow <laughs> step by step where they say, I don't know what I'm doing with this thing. Let me, let me look it up on YouTube. And there's something there that says, okay, here's, you know, watching this stream. Here's how you do it from beginning to end. And, yeah. and I think that definitely mitigates, uh, you know, mitigates things in, in the meantime where people can say, I, I have no idea what this pip thing is, but I'm just going to, I'm just going <laughs> to follow along with it and <laughs> just go along for the ride. And, and one more interjection, because I love I love the long format when I'm like like just chilling and like watching it. But when I'm trying to like build something, like if you're putting it up YouTube, please put your bookmarks with step one go here, step two go there, because like you know like there's a lot of time in between. But when you just want to go to step two and we're talking for 25 minutes about cool awesome other things, like yeah. <laughs> yeah. Good tip. Yeah. Yeah, but, but other than that, like I said, once once the uh, once once you're in, once you're actually in the project and actually working with it, uh, I think that the somebody that's worked with building plugins or audio apps in Juice uh, and knows their way around C plus plus a little bit will yeah. be able to find their way around. It might be a little bit hmm. uh, a little bit a little bit different, but I, uh, it, it's there. It's definitely there. Awesome. Or at least they will be able to learn a lot of things, right? And then afterwards, use these things to go into, for example, making juice plugins or uh, something similar, right? As you said, with the similarity that there are some things you learn from either that or from juice, and you can use in uh, wise plugins as well. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, the 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 model for it. Uh, I use the word model loosely because people use use the word model for something else, but the prototype for it is essentially the same you, mm. you have some type of parameter that needs to be adjusted that you want to expose to the user and that they're able to adjust it using some sort of ui element and then you have some piece of data that's in the background that's being used to change some sort of dsp code mm. and really those are the three those are the three elements right there and once you and once you figured out how to create those then everything I think everything on top is window dressing, you know, for juice, it would be like the UI and how does it look, you know, can we visualize the signal, that sort of thing. But mm -hmm. as long as you have those three kind of components in place and you know how to make those things work, then I think you, you're in a good place to get started. Yeah. Great. Well, I think that sets us up perfectly to uh, tip our hat to the next episode uh, where we'll talk a little bit more about uh, the deeper pieces of creating plugins in Wise, uh, some of that window dressing that you're talking about, creating UI elements uh, that uh, bring a greater level of accessibility, um, closing the loop, monitoring data, uh, custom data, you know, mm. being able to bring in object media, do some processing, maybe some source plugin manipulation. Mm. Um, yeah. We have a lot of ground we could cover in the future. And this is just the tip of the hat to say thanks so much for joining us for this first episode and walking with us as we start to, yeah, just dive deep into this plug in architecture and expose it to people in a way that I think hopefully uh, brings them along for the ride. Um, mm. Thanks to our special um, guests in this QA at the end here, Josh and Megan, thanks so much for sticking with us through it and tuning in <laughs> to the live stream. 
yeah. And great to have your perspectives on it. Thanks so much. Uh, what can I say? Michelle, Samuel, Mads, well done. Uh, great yeah. to have your experience and perspective. Uh, thanks for doing the heavy lifting for me. Uh, <laughs> and uh, and thanks to everyone out there. In the world. <laughs> if uh, if you have instruments, we can go out on a tune. The closing. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so, Megan, you might want to rock those Lacroix cans. I'm not sure. Oh, uh, Josh, yeah. if you can get uh, if you can get the Frenchie to howl, you know we can do a Mademoiselle <laughs> Knobs here. Uh, so thank you again, everyone. Uh, this has been Wise Up on Air, Hands On Programming, Episode One, and. Uh, we hope you're staying good out there. Take care. Take care. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>